late. Welcome to um, people on the webcast today. I think we have about um, 10 people joining us live on the webcast um, from different places around the world. So thank all of you for joining us in person. Uh, my name is Sean Flynn. I'm the Associate Director of our program on Information, Justice, and Intellectual Property. And we're gathered to hear, we brought together um, a number of different people who are observing uh, the WIPO SCCR process in different ways. So that is the Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Rights. And there's two major agenda items um, that have seen some interesting activities over the last year or so in SCC, SCCR. So the first is um, on the broadcast treaty. So the broadcast treaty, as um, many people in the room uh, comment to me, on an ongoing basis has been going on for something like two decades. And the constant question is, why should we pay attention to it now? Is anything really happening? And so that'll be kind of the first question um, from our group is, is, you know, what is occurring on the broadcast treaty? And in short order, you know, there have been over the last couple decades a number of countries who have had blocks on the agenda. Um, and slowly over the last three or four sessions, at least countries' different formal positions have changed. So India and Brazil have released a lot of their um, different uh, positions on the treaty that were subject to a lot of controversy. And most importantly for this audience, the United States has um, released its objections and has come forward with a, a compromise position, which introduced in the last SECR, which now removes kind of formally all the different countries that are obstructing consensus um, to move this towards a diplomatic conference. And so the first question is, does that mean that a diplomatic conference might actually arise? And I'm not sure whether it does. And we'll have um, uh, Jamie Love from KEI kind of kick off that discussion as a person who's been involved through the full um, scope of these uh, negotiations to kind of comment that. And I know a lot of other people in the room have been involved in this for, for many, many years. And so that'll be kind of you know one one prime component of what we'll be talking about, and then the second is the limitations and exceptions agenda. So this is the agenda that follows from the um, the Marrakesh Treaty, so the last successful treaty to move through WIPO, and previous to Marrakesh, there were proposals to have a limitations and exceptions agenda that included not only. Um, people with disabilities, but exceptions for libraries, archives, and museums on one side, and education and research activities on the other. And just yesterday, the SCCR announced um, its agenda for regional meetings on limitations and exceptions. Um, they will take place in Singapore uh, in April 29th, 30th, uh, in Kenya on June 12th and 13th, and in Dominican Republic on um, July, I believe, 3rd and 4th, or 4th and 5th? 4th and 5th. So 4th and 5th. Um, and then after that, there will be a uh, conference in October preceding the next um, SCCR meeting. And I think that's 17th and 18th. I'm stealing Krista's thunder. Um, so there'll be a series of meetings on limitations and exceptions. There, um, there are a couple um, different uh, texts floating around that we'll discuss a little bit. It is certainly nowhere near um, the consensus on the broadcast agenda. There are, you know, uh, it, it is not an area where all countries are, are basically behind the, even the idea of a treaty. Um, and so we'll discuss you know, some of the things that will be discussed in those meetings and, and some of the things that particularly public interest groups are, are advocating within that. So that's kind of the quick introduction. Um, the, the order of our presentations, so um, first Jamie Love will give us kind of the long view of the broadcast treaty, so where we are on that and what are some of the um, concerns from public interest organizations um, on that treaty. Um, then Krista Cox um, from ARL will take us through um, the limitations and exceptions agenda with an emphasis on um, libraries, archives, and museums. Um, I will then present um, some of our uh, research at PIGIP that reflects on both agendas. And then um, Matt Schurz from CCIA will kind of take us out um, and com comment on some of the interests that technology companies have been bringing this to agenda and, and kind of bookend us with some more comments of someone who's actually been involved in, in the long game. 
and reflect on um, kind of where we are and where tech companies um, are presently. Um, there's a series of handouts outside of, of especially some of the materials that I'll be discussing um, from Pidgeup. You can always pick those up after. Um, and there'll be plenty of time for some discussion afterwards. So we encourage you to um, think of questions and comments that you want to bring to bear. Um, as I mentioned on the outside, this is a live recorded and public session. Um, <clears throat> and so we uh, welcome all of you that are, that are joining us uh, from the web. And it will also be available um, recorded at the same website, so it will be available for on-demand viewing later to help prepare a record for people who are preparing for negotiations in the future. So with that, let me turn it over to Jamie, who will kick us off with the long view. Okay, great. Uh, um, <clears throat> how, many, how many of you uh, in the audience here have uh, attended a WIPO SSCR session before? Well, that's, a, that's pretty good. Um, it's um, uh, they, my, my, the first time I um, attended a WIPO, a WIPO uh, negotiation was in, in 1996 when they did the digital uh, treaties back then. I was primarily following the, a treaty that uh, didn't deal with copyright. It had to do with creating a sui generis right for um, databases. I mean, they were discussing the database treaty as well as the digital rights treaty. And uh, the, the copyright treaties, the WCT, the WPP, they actually came forward during, the, um, uh, during that diplomatic conference. The, the database treaty, which was, um, looked like it might go, the Europeans were really pushing for it, was eventually stopped because the United States opposed it, changed its position actually in the middle of the treaty. And that was a treaty that would convey an intellectual property right based on the idea that somebody had assembled a database, they weren't the owner of the data, underlying data per se, they, they, they didn't really create the data, they collected the data, and they would make it available through the databases. And initially the, uh, the, um, um, initially the uh, database companies in the United States, like uh, Dun & Bradstreet uh, uh, and other companies, had sort of perceived this to be a positive thing for them because they were in the database business, Bloomberg and groups like that. At a certain point, though, they began to understand that in order to assemble and create a database, uh, they had to get data from third parties, and it, it just was actually a negative for them to have these sui generis rights. So going forward, you, you have a situation where the Europeans have this right on an investment-based right on databases, and the United States didn't, and the United States has actually done very well in, on the database thing and has actually done better than the Europeans. At the same time, if you go back on the broadcasting thing, there was a similar story with the Rome Convention in the sense that Europeans uh, 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 and, and other countries that have followed the European model uh, 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 had, had adopted something called the Rome Treaty, and it was a, 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 a right for broadcasting organizations that transmitted data uh, uh, that was separate from the rights that would, that would go to, say, uh, producers of photograms or performers or authors. Uh, now the background on the um, on the Rome Convention. Um, some, uh, this is a bit of a long view, so I'm going to go back to that a bit. The history um, of the way the um, the Rome Convention came about uh, was that uh, initially, as most I don't know how 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 much everyone here is a copyright scholar. I have the uh, uh, I have the impression people here are pretty knowledgeable about copyright, but. Uh, it was just the authors were the, basically the people that were protected initially. And uh, when you had uh, the development of, uh, of, uh, of uh, recorded music and radio, uh, you began to have, uh, a, 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 and, and motion pictures, you began to have a lot more attention to the role of performers or actors or people that produce music records. And uh, there was, uh, the, the feeling at the time was that if, if, if a performer performed a work, uh, they had to get whatever rights they had as a contract with a copyright owner, that it had to be derivative of that. But there was activity by labor unions representing, there was like, uh, you know, really, labor unions were pretty strong back in the uh, beginning of the, 19th, of, of the 20th century. There was a lot of agitation to sort of bring rights directly to 
to to performers, and they were actually the most important part of the uh, lead up to the Rome Convention. Was really they were very compelling figures. They were popular culturally. People knew who they were, and um, uh, and and people sort of saw what 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 they did in in, in performing uh, as as comparable to what the authors uh, were getting. And you saw um, this movement toward uh, some type of uh, uh, new, new, new set of rights, uh, other than the uh, the Berne Convention, which had really been around the rights of the authors, to create this, uh, these, these re what they call in some place, some place they call related rights, or some places they call uh, neighboring rights. Uh, and uh, uh, as, as this thing moved uh, toward a, a slowly, uh, really from like before the Second World War up until nineteen. Uh, uh, 60 when you really had the Rome, uh, 1961 when you had the Rome Convention, you had the rise of television. And television was perceived to be a very expensive operation at the time. And it was also something that um, uh, uh, was, uh, uh, where there was no way of charging people money for it. I mean, it was just put out like radio was put out over there. It was for free. It was supported by advertising. There were certain public interest obligations. And uh, uh, the television and radio operators uh, really kind of relied upon the actors to sort of move forward the Rome Convention. Uh, and then, so the, the, the pecking order was sort of the, the performers and then maybe the producers of phonograms and then kind of in the back of the bus kind of like, you know, being kind of discreet but also wanting to have rights where the, where the, where, where the uh, uh, the, the television uh, and radio people that wanted to have some type of related rights. Uh, so they, they, they had the idea that, uh, that they, they played this, this important role in, 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 in bringing the works of the performers to the public and that they should be entitled to some kind of rights. Well, the United States never signed the, the Rome Convention. About half the world decided to ex extend whatever rights they gave to performers through the copyright and give very limited rights to, to broadcasters on retransmission and things, but not the whole type of economic rights that you see in Europe. And, and the world's sort of been divided on that for a long time. Well, after the 96 copyright treaties, uh, you saw this upgrading of the rights for, for, uh, for, for authors and then you know, eventually for, uh, uh, with the Beijing Treaty, you sort of saw this, it finally extended to, uh, to performers. Uh, the the broadcasters were always uh, arguing that that you should change uh, their their uh, their agreement as well that they that they were kind of left out of the of the of the system. If you look at the at the taxonomy, you had the copyright, and then you had the related rights for the uh, uh, the performers and 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 the uh, producers of phonograms, but you had nothing yet done for the, the bright. So they had this kind of were really entitled. Academically, that was really, they were considered like a really weak party in the whole thing. Uh, and things ch so much changed in the technology during that period. Like uh, you've gone from a lot of free, free television being the dominant paradigm and free radio to satellite radio to uh, uh, video being delivered initially over cable, cable, cable television with encryption and where you, you know, they cut it off if you don't pay for it. So it was no longer really a free service. And... Um, uh, and eventually uh, being streamed over the internet and things like that. So there's been a big change in the way video's been delivered and radio's been delivered during that time. And uh, also, also on the economics. So what, what this treaty is about is whether or not uh, this old legacy of the Rome Convention will sort of stand up in, in, in the internet age and whether or not uh, the idea of transmitting information has a separate intellectual property right from the idea of actually creating the information in the first place. And uh, the Europeans uh, influenced a lot by the, the, tele the, the, the television operators in Europe have, you know, claiming they're like, you know, suffering economically, they're going out of business, they, you know, you know they, they can't make money anymore and they have to compete against these new internet platforms and things like that. So what they're arguing for is that the legacy broadcasters get these robust intellectual property rights, including post-fixation rights, making available, uh, 
uh, post fixation rates for 50 years from the, from the, the previous uh, broadcast of things, uh, and that those rights not be applied, not be available to webcasters or people that work on regular um, uh, internet platforms. Uh, that there'd be like some kind of special right that they would have. And, 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 and then when people look at this, uh, uh, okay, so it, there's a whole series of problems associated with this. Um, right now, we're accustomed to the idea that if there's copyright in a work, and often that's a complex group of contractual agreements or things before you get to a work. I mean, there may be, um, uh, like a film, for example, may involve, you know, uh, 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 quite a few different parties. Once you clear the rights uh, uh, with a copyright owner, then under, under under the related rights concept, you'd have to clear a separate right from the broad, from the broadcasters. Now there are certain time, certain environments, uh, certain certain places, including like for the United States, where performers, for example, are not compensated. Uh, uh, for what they do uh, if, if, if it works on radio, for example. But uh, uh, under this treaty, the radio operator would, would have an economic right with a collection society that, for example, the performers wouldn't have, uh, even though they didn't acquire by contract or payment of any money or remuneration any rights from the copyright owner themselves. In fact, what the broadcasters are really uh, are asking for is that no matter how they acquire the content, if they acquire it without entering into a contract with the content maker, if, they, if the work's in the public domain, if the work's not subject to copyright, um, uh, if the copyright exists but it's expired, or if, uh, uh, you know, wh whatever the facts are, uh, and without having to negotiate, that they automatically uh, get a right, and that you'd have to clear that right, and that right would persist uh, from anyone who got the information uh, from you. Um, now, uh, uh, so uh, if you were to, let me just go through a few things. I get kind of a long, this is kind of a deranged, uh, poorly organized talk. I apologize for that. But I'm going to switch to something else right now. I'm, what, what's up in the screen is that I did, uh, uh, for White Boy, I did this table last year, which would have to be updated today. But I tried to walk people through the evolution of what's happened in, 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 in broadcasting. And I tried to show uh, through, through a color coding of a timeline. And I should have passed this out as a handout. Because, uh, but the, the, the color coding is that white is, are things that were technological developments for uh, 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 tr traditional uh, broadcasting, like, like the development of television, for example, or radio, um, or satellite television. So the things in white over here, and I have, uh, let's see, how do I, how does that, is there a way to make this thing go down? Um, yeah. You know how to do it? Oh, there, there, there's the cursor way up there. Okay, great. I'm not used to the. Uh, what is this? Is a, like a Windows thing, right? Okay, there, there we go. Okay, all right, all right, good. good. Okay, um, uh, what what's in blue are the technologies to make the physical copies. Like RPM records in in, uh, in 1887, LP records in 1948, compact cassette discs, eight track discs, compact discs, digital you know for for, uh, for recorded music, digital music, and then the green is norm setting. So uh, you know you'd have the um, um, the European Agreement on the Protection of Del of Television Broadcast. It came the year before the Rome Convention. And you have a whole series of things that took place. There's the, uh, here's the, um, uh, the 96 treaties at the top. And then the orange was, or, or the yellow rather, was things were happening with the internet. And so in the beginning, you see a lot of, a lot of 
a, a fair amount of white stuff and some blue and you know s some green. And then over a while, over a period of time, what you see are just a lot of yellow things. It's not very <laughs> articulate on this, but like as everybody in this room knows, everything that's been happening right now has been happening basically on the internet in terms of all the innovations that are taking place. So WIPO is obsessed with creating rights for people whose legitimacy is that they do things not on the internet, that they broadcast traditional television and they have broadcast licenses or they have broadcast TV. And whereas the original Rome Convention only was dealing with over-the-air television and over-the-air radio, they've redefined traditional broadcasting to include things that are delivered via satellite with encryption and over cable with encryption. Um, and, uh, and they have a kind of a funny way of defining it. So if you think of like who the beneficiaries are or, or who broadcasters are, you know, you and I might think the broadcaster might be, you know, a, 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 a television station, or you might think it's something like CNN, for example, which, which, uh, which goes over cable, but it's sort of broadcast over cable platforms or through satellite platforms. Um, they, they, they define the channels in the treaty is a critical thing. So uh, it's the people that schedule the content. So it's not the content that's protected, it's the platform that schedules the content. So uh, uh, a radio station would be protected because they have a playlist. Uh, 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 CNN would be protected to the extent that they have one show after the other. If they create original content like a news show, that is a separate claim of protection, which would be copyright. But the fact that they schedule the content is, is sort of the key basis for the protection. On the other hand, they want to have protection for deferred broadcast over the internet. So a key thing here is this proposal, I think, by Argentina. Um, if I can figure out how to get this. Um, in your folder. Yeah, the folder. And I gotta figure out which is the, <laughs> I should have better notes of which is which here because they just have numbers here. Um, okay. Uh, let's see if this is the Argentine one or if it's, it? Oh, that's the chair's proposal. Um, um, the, Back down there. Where? Yeah. Okay. I'm used to something that's a little easier to work on than this, but. Um, yeah, use the buttons. Yeah, there you go. That's the U.S. proposal 37. <coughs> So that would probably be um, <coughs> that's another chair document. <coughs> I'm going to go through a bunch of them until I find the one I'm looking for here. I tell you, uh, yeah, this is the Argentine proposal. So the Argent Argentines they have these definitions I'm going to show you, which are. Um, Key definitions are going to be equivalent deferred transmission and closely related transmission, uh, deferred transmission and unrelated deferred transmission. And and so in these negotiations, the United States is playing a, uh, in my opinion, a pretty positive role. They're trying to discourage the idea that you create post-fixation rights that go to broadcasting organizations only that last for 50 years from every broadcast. I mean, you can have, you, you essentially would end the public domain for anything that went over a broadcast was copied from there because from every time they broadcast, the 50 years starts. So unless you like are archiving the thing 50 years ahead of time, you would never have a copy that wasn't protected, uh, let alone 
being able to play or you know use the use the version that you got 50 years ago. So uh, the U.S. is trying to sort of stop that. People like Argentina, uh, our, our countries like Argentina and the European Union, and the, basically the Latin American um, broadcasters and the European broadcasters in particular, they really want these these rights. Now they they know the future is a video on demand that people want to basically get time and place and choosing. So they have these definitions, equivalent deferred, closely uh, related deferred, and unrelated deferred transmission. What they want to do, because looking at the politics, that they want a situation where they can get as many of these rights, uh, these definitions as possible, mandatory in the treaty, but they, they, they don't think they can get everything. So they think that unrelated deferred transmissions by a broadcaster, so the idea is that Netflix couldn't get it, but, uh, but Disney could. That's kind of their idea, because Disney's also a broadcaster. So Disney would get the right, but Nef that, their theory is Netflix wouldn't get the right, as if, as if Netflix didn't have the capacity to buy a television station somewhere on the planet uh, at some point in time. Uh, that's sort of the fiction here, uh, or that Spotify couldn't buy or Pandora couldn't buy uh, a radio station, things that are, in fact, already happening right now uh, in, in several countries. So for the unre unrelated deferred transmission, they want to say that it would be optional so that if Argentina had uh, this, this, this layer of rights for the, un the unrelated deferred trans transmission, that uh, uh, they could do it even though the United States chose not to do it. But then they would say that in order to extend rights to a transmission that was copied from the United States, the U.S. would also have to have the rights. So they'd have a, an architecture. So there'd be optional rights. But to protect a foreign party, the foreign government would have had to have the same right they'd have, which is an upward ratchet. So a lot of the pressure would be the broadcasters would come in and say, our, our broadcasts are not protected in the foreign market under these, these new rights which are being granted because we don't have the same right here. So in order for us to be on the level playing field with the foreign broadcasters, we'd have to do it. And in fact, you know, if, you're, if you want to pick up a perpetual right on the unrelated deferred transmission, then why not originate it in a foreign market where they have the most aggressive right? and then just license it from those rights for wherever you want to do it. Because once it passes through a broadcast distribution, it picks up a 50-year right, which is completely independent and on top of any copyright that might exist or not exist. Uh, so we, we perceive this as a not a very good compromise, but this is actually what we're kind of looking at if you go into a, a diplomatic conference right now. now Shira has been, uh, I think they're going to hold a, a teleconference uh, two days from now where they're going to explain what's going on with the U.S. position. You should know that the U.S. used to have a lot of countries on their side in these negotiations. They used to be closely aligned with India and Brazil, Iran, other countries in these negotiations. And uh, uh, there used to be a lot of poison pills in the negotiation, the so-called juicy exceptions that were sort of I, I designed to kind of create more opposition to the thing, which are in a different document. I, if I had time, I could show you things on cultural diversity, defensive competition, you know, more robust exceptions language. What's happened over time is that the broadcasters, because they put politicians on television, and they have influence uh, 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 in, 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 even more so than, the, in, than they do in the United States in some countries. So in Brazil, O Globo, the biggest broadcaster and media organization in Brazil, got the previous president of Brazil to flip and completely change their positions from being an opponent to a supporter of the treaty and being a supporter of a bad version of the treaty and to abandon all of their previous positions on copyright limitations and exceptions. That was really a big deal. And then in India, uh, a, a group called the Z Network of Television, uh, was ver a very big supporter of Mahdi in uh, India, has done quite a bit to moderate and change the Indian position during the negotiations. <clears throat> 
what has happened is that the United States is increasingly isolated in the negotiations in a way that was not the case 10 years ago when this treaty was essentially stopped at, at one point. So the U.S. is more isolated right now. There's much more pressure. And the chairman of, of, of this committee that's been chairing it for a while, a guy named Darren Tang, who is the head of the intellectual property office in Singapore, is now a candidate to be the next director general of WIPO. And he perceives that being able to conclude this treaty and bring it into a diplomatic conference is essential for Darren Tang, uh, Tang's candidacy to be the head of WIPO. So he's really into it and he really wants to push it. And Darren is not the sort of inclusive, talk to all sides, find a compromise kind of guy that the previous chairman was. Darren just is working very closely with the secretariat, particularly uh, 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 Sylvie from the, the, the new ADG that's over copyright now, uh, used to work for Vivendi. She is from France. She very much wants this treaty to be deliverable, and Francis Curry also wants to see this because he thinks the number of treaties they crank out from WIPO is the way that they keep score on how successful you are as a multilateral organization. So Americans, they don't believe this treaty can go anywhere because it's so crazy and it's so stupid that you're going to be giving people that are, don't create content, don't pay for content, don't license tech content, none of those things. An automatic right that goes 50 years from the time every time that they redistribute work. I mean, book publishers don't get 50 years of a text every time they publish it. I mean, it's 50 years from when it's written, right? It's not 50 years from the last time you do Tom Sawyer or something like that. Now, it, it, actually, in, in books, it wouldn't be such a big deal because you could find another copy of a book somewhere, probably one that was published 100 years ago. In films, you're not going to be able to find those copies. You, you, you're just not. So uh, Americans, though, they just sort of look at this as sort of some crazy idea because the negotiations have been going on so long. They don't believe it's really going to go anywhere. We have a, a very different view of this. We are really scared about this treaty. We think this treaty will be very transformative. Um, now, whether or not it goes beyond video, it's kind of hard to say. We think it's going to be very unlikely that the final result of this treaty will be that it will apply only to Channel 7 and Channel 5 and CNN. We think it will eventually become something that becomes kind of a... a uh, uh, a, a, a new type of intellectual property thing on anything that goes out on a stream, including this broadcast that we're doing right now, because you essentially are broadcasting at this point, right? And because AM, AMU, you, you have a radio station, right? So I think this broadcast is probably covered by the, the broadcast treaty for another 50 years, you know, uh, just as an example. And, and frankly, the, the, the nexus between owning a broadcast license and having the right, it's hard to see how that's the end game of this thing. Because the people, as they switch to the new platforms, they're going to kind of question whether or not, you know, you really want to give this special deal to BBC <coughs> and the broadcasters as you have historically. I'm just going to stop here at this point and answer questions, I guess. Great. Thank you. Um, let me just say for the, for the folks out on the web, there is a... a we're going to answer questions over Twitter when we get there, and the uh, uh, Twitter handle you can you can send any questions to at wcl underscore pigip. Um, so let me now turn it over to Chris to take us through the limitations. Of sure. I know. Thank you, Sean. Um, so I am here today to talk about uh, some of the discussions that have been going on around limitations and exceptions for libraries, archives, and museums. I'm going to keep this, um, I think, at a higher level because, as Sean indicated, uh, the discussions um, around limitations and exceptions aren't as um, aren't as advanced as they are on broadcast. So, um, my name is Krista Cox. I'm with the Association of Research Libraries, which is a member of the Library Copyright Alliance, along with the American Library Association and the Association of College and Research Libraries. And I'm here. Um, on behalf of Jonathan Band, who is our outside counsel and is hopefully enjoying his vacation. Um, so you get me today. Uh, 
So why are libraries, archives, and museums interested in limitations and exceptions at WIPO? Um, in the United States, we're very lucky, libraries and archives and museums here, to benefit from copyright limitations and exceptions. Um, for libraries and archives, we have specific limitations and exceptions under Section 108 of copyright law, as well as other um, parts of the copyright law that, that we depend on, like the first sale doctrine, Chafee Amendment, um, and of course, fair use. But a lot of countries don't have the same uh, limitations and exceptions we do have for libraries, archives, and museums. Um, and they also don't have fair use, or some of them don't have fair dealing. Uh, so the idea behind this um, broadly is to harmonize limitations and exceptions and recognize the importance that limitations and exceptions play for core library, archive, and museum activities. And of course, library, archives, and museums are cultural heritage institutions. They have a mission to preserve and provide access to educational, scientific, literary, and cultural works, both uh, in the analog world and the digital world. Um, but copyright can hinder uh, the mission of, of libraries, archives, and museums if they don't have proper limitations and exceptions. Um, so the idea behind this is that there would be some sort of instrument uh, for limitations and exceptions that countries could adopt to facilitate um, the, the core missions of preservation and providing access. And the committee has already started drafting um, an instrument, and as Sean mentioned earlier, there is an action plan at uh, WIPO SCCR right now. Um, it was adopted last year, and it'll go through the uh, last meeting of this year, the last SCCR meeting. So the next SCCR meeting will take place, um, I think, the first week of April, and followed by the three regional meetings that, that Sean mentioned, and then the International Conference in Geneva, which will be immediately followed by the last SCCR meeting um, for this year. So um, as part of that action plan, at least the portion related to libraries, archives, and museum, is to kind of build on the work that's already been done um, during previous SCCR meetings. And, um, uh, you know, there's been, for example, Ken Cruz did a study several years ago and then updated it and presented it again to WIPO um, covering the limitations and exceptions that exist in, in various countries for libraries and archives. And then there was also another study done um, on, on museums that was presented uh, at SCCR last year. Uh, and uh, you know, the SCCR is going to be focusing on different issues that are related to the, the core missions of uh, libraries, archives, and museums, such as conservation, access, use of works, particularly in the uh, digital environment. And then these regional seminars will cover um, the limitations and exceptions in the regions where these meetings will be taking place. Uh, and looking to see whether current copyright laws hinder the mission of cultural heritage institutions, whether um, existing limitations and ex limitations and exceptions are sufficient to meet the um, the activities that the institutions are doing or want to do, what the legal uncertainties are, what um, chilling effects there might be in in preventing these institutions from doing what they want to do, and what the cross border issues are. Uh, so right now, there is a proposal, um, kind of like a discussion draft, a, a framework treaty for libraries, archives, and museums um, that is designed to facilitate the public service role that libraries, archives, and museums have while maintaining the balance between the rights of authors and the public interest. Um, and that proposal would apply to seven protected activities and also uh, apply to cross-border acquisition and these uses. So the seven activities, um, which are really core to what libraries, archives, and museums do, they either you know, facilitate the preservation, preservation mission or the, arc, um, or the access mission, are preservation, providing copies of materials to individual researchers and other users in any format, lending works to a user or another um, library, archive, or museum, there's kind of an orphan works pr provision, um, which would allow the reproduction and the making available of any work for which the author or right holder could not be identified after a reasonable inquiry in accordance with uh, the domestic law of that country. Uh, also a provision for translation when it's not available in the language that's required for the purposes of teaching scholarship or research. 
also on accessibility for making and providing accessible format copies to persons with disabilities, including by import and export. And as uh, Sean mentioned, um, this uh, limitations and exceptions work kind of follows on from the last treaty that was concluded at WIPO, which of course was the Marrakesh Treaty, which was designed to facilitate access to published works for people who are blind, visually impaired, or otherwise print disabled. Um, the accessibility provision in um, this framework treaty is broader than that. It could apply to people, for example, with hearing disabilities. Um, and then the final um, protected activity would be uh, for text and data mining as permitted under national law. Uh, another critical feature of this uh, draft framework treaty would be a contract override or preemption provision so that contracts um, couldn't be used to prevent libraries, archives, or museums from exercising um, the limitations and exceptions under this treaty. And that's really critical, especially because of um, how much material is shared these days digitally. So a lot of times when work is um, being made available digitally, it's not really being sold to the user. It is being licensed. Um, and oftentimes there are contractual provisions that that prevent uh, certain uses such as text and data mining or you have to get another license to, um, to exercise that right. Uh, the framework treaty also adjust, addresses technological protection measures to ensure that they do not prevent the enjoyment of the limitations and exceptions covered and also provide for limitations and liability for the institutions as well as for the employees of the institutions that are acting under good faith. So that is kind of a high level summary of um, kind of the core issues that are being discussed around this. And uh, of course, we are looking forward to working with um, the international community, working with our partners in these different regions um, and attending uh, probably one of the regional seminars uh, and continuing to, to go to the SCCR meetings to discuss how we might move forward on uh, this agenda. Okay, thank you. This one is getting a little bit of feedback. Let me see if I can try this one instead. Um, so thank you, thank you, Krista. Um, so that I think you know sets out um, a little bit of a review of the two major categories of action that are going on. So on the one side, on the broadcast, which is really text-based and you know very much discussing the terms of a specific treaty, and then the um, the the library treaty has been the longest standing part of the limitations and exceptions agenda post Marrakesh. So that one is furthest along. Although I would say that actual discussions of treaty text haven't gone on for the last at least four or six SCCRs. So, you know, the discussion on that agenda item is very much not text-based these days, although there's a text introduced. And so, you know, part of the work on that limitations and exceptions agenda has been to, you know, try to revive actual discussions around, around um, text in that area. So with that, I want to turn um, a little bit to some of the research that PIGIP is doing um, that's related to both of these agenda items. So our research in this area has been focusing on the limitations and exceptions aspects of the treaty. So we have not been getting um, very deeply into you know, some of the questions that Jamie was talking about, the definitions of rights, the terms of protections, things like that within the broadcast treaty. Um, but we have been interested in um, trying to look at the, the possibility or the, uh, the, the opportunity um, for progressing a limitations and exceptions agenda within that treaty as well as within the, um, the other work um, at WIPO and in other places, um, trade agreements and other aspects of international law. So our research essentially has two sides. So one is um, empirical, um, trying to do um, a mapping of limitations and exceptions around the world and what where some of the gaps are to try to elucidate what international law could do that might be helpful in this area. Um, and then also tying that to impact analysis yeah. to What's look that? at um, the effects of changing um, particular limitations and exceptions to make them more open to the digital environment. And so that's kind of, you know, in, uh, a research aspect of why we might want international law in this area. And then the second part of our research is essentially um, doctrinal, looking at some of um, what some of the options might be um, in this area. So I just want to take us through um, each of those aspects. 
and the the results of of this research are are outside. So um, this this is a chart from our user rights database study. And so all of this work is being coordinated by um, Mike Palmetto, who's in the room. He's the one that did this chart and, and most of the, um, the outputs of this empirical research that I'll be referring to. So several years ago, uh, we put together a meeting of economists that are working um, in intellectual property and specifically in copyright and essentially ask them, why is all of your work focused on rights and none of it's focused on limitations and exceptions? Because there is a bubbling interest, at least among policy advocates, around what's the potential positive impact of adopting, for instance, US-style fair use rights around the world? So there's eight or nine countries that now have fair use. Is it good? Is it bad? What, how, do, how do we kind of analyze that? So the answer from most of those economists was, well, we don't have an independent variable to study. It's very difficult for us to figure out, except for just kind of fair use on and off, what, what, where the detailed changes in exceptions are so that we can map them against impact variables to figure out what the impact might be. So thus began the user rights database. So we mapped, um, I think there's uh, about roughly 40 countries. We separated them into high and middle income countries. And we looked not just at whether they've adopted fair use, but how open their exceptions are to various kinds of modern digital uses. So digital works, users, um, different kinds of purposes and activities that would be prevalent within you know, a modern economy. And what you find is that there's a huge gap. So this is kind of the first part of why you might want international law in the area, which is to promote harmonization. So as there used to be within the rights, there is now in the exceptions environments radical differentiation between different countries. And in general, you can group it basically between high and low income countries. The wealthier countries tend to have exceptions that are much more open to the kinds of works, users, and users that are prevalent within the modern internet economy. Countries that are in, and we only did um, high and middle, we left out LDCs. And what you find is that the middle income countries have updated their copyright laws much less frequently. And when they do so, they don't focus on the limitations and exceptions as much. And so when you look at a country like South Africa that's, that's modernizing its copyright law today, it is roughly about 30 years behind what a country in Europe or what the United States has done in terms of paying attention to the digital environment. So where, where are those areas? So where is the differentiation? And so on the right-hand side, you have you know, the same grouping of country, the higher income countries, and on the left-hand side, you have the middle income countries. And you find basically the most important exceptions are also the ones that are the most narrow in the countries that need them the most. So sometimes I think there's this idea within the political rhetoric that um, developing countries are free riding and that they're opportunists and they're just going to kind of use these exceptions to create huge spaces um, for the use of copyrighted works. And you actually find when you look at the actual laws that the opposite is true. That in areas like education, in private use, uh, even in quotation, and certainly in areas like text and data mining, there are much more restrictive exceptions in poorer countries than more wealthy ones. So that's kind of the first, why do we have um, uh, a limitations and exceptions agenda? It's for the same reasons we have a rights agenda, which is that there's massive differences in between countries and that those differences can have economic and social effects. And so it's towards that next question that we've done a little bit of starting empirical research using these models. So um, one area we've been looking at because of the education agenda and WIPO is to look at the differences in education rights, for instance. So asking this kind of a question, um, how many uh, within those groups of countries in which, in which country could a teacher reproduce a work of art for teaching purposes? So that kind of un unpacks a couple different elements, right? So if you have a very restrictive environment, often it, it delineates the specific activities you can do. Whereas fair use, for instance, in the United States says you can make a use. A use is any use. Any potentially protected use you may do. 
Fair use doesn't restrict based on the user, right? It's any person may make any use. It doesn't restrict the kind of work. So any user may make any use of any kind of work. And then as long as, and the work is done in the fairness test, as long as you're not displacing markets, et cetera, right? So if you look around the world, countries that lack fair use often have much more restrictive exceptions within their specific categories. So they may, for instance, restrict that kind of work. So if you restrict it to, for instance, a literary work and not an artistic work, then you're going to fall on the right-hand side of the graph. Or if you only have a right for a library, not for a teacher, then you're going to fall on the right-hand side of the graph. <laughs> so every time you kind of move the debate towards restrictions about the use and the user, and the type of activity, instead of focusing on the fairness test, you're going to have a much more limited range of activities that can plausibly come into your, into your right. And again, that's what we find when we look in the poorer countries, is that you have much more kind of restrictions, and therefore there are many more kinds of activities that just are plainly unlawful under the Act. So a different way to kind of unpack the same data is just by region. And again, you know, North America and Asia score much higher, Latin America, Africa score much lower. So just another way to unpack the kind of need for harmonization question that comes out of um, some of our mapping. So the second piece is, is, and we've just kind of begun some of this research, but is um, now that we have, and, and the way we set up that database was it's not, it's not um, a moment in time. It actually looks at when laws were changed over time from 1970 to 2016. And so you're able to do before and after econometric studies and show that um, after countries open their limitations and exceptions in various ways, you can actually see growths in technology is one thing we looked at, and scholarship production is another thing we looked at. So at least in our kind of preliminary analysis, um, we show that some of the theoretical literature on these issues seems to be validated within the empirics, which is that uh, technology companies, including technology companies where US multinationals are involved, do better in countries with more open exceptions environments, that the production of scholarship is higher in countries with more open um, uh, exceptions environments. And then we also show within the studies, we, we show other factors and, and we show also that um, traditional copyright industries like entertainment and publishing do better or at least just as well um, in these environments as well. So we do, we do not find a large cost to traditional copyright sectors in opening limitations and exceptions. So that's the second piece. So the first piece is there's a lack of harmonization and it shows, right, that poorer countries have less open um, exceptions environments than richer ones. And the second is the impact, you know, using some more sophisticated economic analysis, we actually show that opening your exceptions seem to help. Um, and they help in areas that have cross-border effects, which is the reason you might want international law to intervene in this area. So, um, so U.S. Uh, or foreign subsidiaries of U.S. multinationals, for instance, do better in countries with more open environments. We haven't looked specifically at trade flows. And then one of the anecdotal um, pieces of evidence that we get from our Creative Commons project that, that Meredith is uh, not here, unfortunately, is going to talk a little bit about today. But if you think about that divergence and the interest in, for instance, sharing educational materials across borders, so if you were to make um, an open educational material, an, an educational material in which you pay for the good up front and you want to share it through an open license to allow you know, multiple different institutions to use that work and, and standardize what people are learning from, and you want to share that across borders, then if you've made that good in a work with a broad exceptions environment like the United States under fair use, and you want to transfer or use that work or distribute that work in a country with much more limited exceptions environment, then your lawyers may get a little up in arms. So you're going to have to look through what's included in that open educational resource and try to decide whether you can use or distribute you know, in a more restrictive environment. 
So that kind of points towards one of the huge breakthroughs um, in the Marrakesh Agreement, which was to come up with some cross-border norms around this issue. And the Marrakesh Agreement essentially says if you make it lawfully in one country, then you can use it lawfully in any other country. And that would be a law that would really open up the ability to think about cross-border trade and open educational resources, which a lot of the open educational publishers are not doing partially for this copyright fear. So if we were to think about this kind of new era in which we had a rich supply of educational resources that were affordable throughout the world, um, international copyright is one of the areas that you might really need to get over to, um, to actualize that vision. Okay, which leads us to our doctrinal analysis. So what might you do if you kind of took that part of the research to heart and wanted to advance um, a limitations and exceptions agenda that catered for some of these um, terms? And so here we've done various projects kind of mapping the international field. So um, it's not true that the only thing that copyright treaties say on limitations and exceptions is you shall confine them to the three-step test. We have been evolving a large number of different, either on the one side, protections of the policy space within countries to have limitations and exceptions of their own design. And then on the other side, actual requirements that countries harmonize towards specific standards. So I've left off the kind of confining because we, we've seen those all over the place, but mapped a couple of the areas where we have promotion or provision mandates. So kind of either permissive or mandatory areas. And they go, of course, back to Byrne. So, you know, Byrne set those up, you know, required you to have quotation exception, permitted you to have a teaching exception. Um, moving into the Rome Convention. So again, now you're talking about related rights. Even back in 1961, carved out a broader list of permissive exceptions than Byrne. And that's, I think, an interesting shift that makes a lot of analytical sense that when you're starting to move into exclusive rights that have a lower value, that have a lower um, contribution of creativity within the construction of, the, of those um, goods or services, you should have a richer exceptions environment, right? So you should have a larger space to kind of use products that are protected by related rights or neighboring rights than you might have in copyright. And so Rome took that step forward. Um, it specifically provided for permissive private use, for use of short effort, ephemeral fixation, doesn't appear in Bern at all, or for the purposes of teaching appears in Bern, but research appears for the first time in Rome. Um, again, we talked a little bit about, about Marrakesh, um, and you know, would, would point out specifically in Marrakesh, and this is an, an area where interestingly the copyright is getting ahead of the related rights, which is in Beijing, there is a provision that permits you to have TPM exceptions. And in Marrakesh, there's a provision that requires you to have TPM exceptions. So this, as we kind of move beyond Rome, copyright is now, from Marrakesh, in front of related rights. We actually have a rip, richer exceptions environment in copyright than we have for related rights, even in the most modern treaties. And then I just included the InfoSoc Directive here as an interesting example of where an international law, essentially, but not a multilateral law, has been taking that desire to protect digital uses one step further and has kind of a, has a mandatory right for temporary acts of reproduction to facilitate technological processes. And one of the areas, and I'll, and I'll just allude to it here and, and show you to it in a minute, but is can we combine that idea with the research idea? You know, could there be a right to technological research, to non-consumptive use, to some of the areas that are really on the cutting edge of where research is going today? Why shouldn't that be entering kind of the international field? And isn't the broadcast treaty the perfect place to do it? Okay, so where are we actually in broadcast? So here's the provision in the actual broadcast treaty, and it has none of that. So it is really only a confining clause. It doesn't promote or protect. 
So it says that you can only have the exceptions you already have in your copyright for broadcast. So even though most of what is broadcasted is already protected by copyright, and therefore the need to have that extra right, as Jamie was talking about, is fairly minimal. So you're talking about the protection of a signal in the rare case where the underlying content isn't already protected by copyright, which is extremely infrequent. I mean, so even um, the commentary and camera angles on a live sports broadcast are themselves protected by copyright. So if you're really protecting just a signal, then shouldn't you have a richer, not a more narrow exceptions environment in the treaty. Isn't this a space where we should be doing more for some of the top issues that are on the agenda now? Libraries, archives, museums, education, research. Why aren't some of these items from the other piece of the SSCR agenda getting into the broadcast agenda itself? So the first paragraph is you may only do what you have in copyright. And the second paragraph is the three-step test, right? And so this is what was in Rome. And so the important point is this is a step back from what they created in 1961. So you'll see 1961, the you can do what you do in copyright is second. First, it says you can do these other things. You can have private use. You can have short excerpts. You can have ephemeral fixation. You can have teaching. You can have research. And then in addition, irrespective of Article 1, in addition, you may have everything you do in copyright. So if the broadcast law was passed just as it is, the limitations and exceptions environment has actually lost something in this mix. We'd be moving forward on the rights protection and we'd be moving backward simultaneously on the limitations and exceptions environment. So there was a proposal that it was included in, I, sh I should have been like Jamie and put the actual number in here. I think it was SCCR 35. Um, but there's a citation to it in the um, agenda for today that is linked to it. But so there was an alternative text that was bracketed that proposed to go further that had the, the, that had the Rome text, but then added to them a permissive, not a mandatory, but a, a, per, a explicit permission to have exceptions for disability. Right, so bringing in line with Marrakesh, exceptions for archives and, and educational institutions and libraries. And then in addition, making clear that if, if there was uh, that content that wasn't already protected would continue to not be protected. So that, that would have kind of updated, moved Rome forward by permitting a larger range of exceptions. But about two or three SCCRs ago, this text was deleted and it no longer occurs within the current chair's chart. So in the current chair's chart, there is just the provision that I looked at before. It's unbracketed, and some countries refer to it as closed. So it's, it's not clear we're gonna get anything else uh, if this goes forward. So you know, one of the asks of the public interest community is to reopen um, that discussion. Okay. Um, some of my own views uh, were published in an IP Watch uh, article, and the, essentially the, the point of that is why not take more lessons from that chart on the mandatory side? Why would you not have mandatory provisions instead of just permissive provisions? And I'll just kind of point out the final one is the effort to combine the research with the technological rights from the InfoSoc Directive. So expanding that kind of idea to be able to have temporary copies to include non-consumptive uses of materials. And for broadcast, this is pretty important, right? Like, so if you wanna have tools to, for instance, crawl all the broadcasts in order to get data out of them, to analyze what's going on in the broadcast environment through technological tools, it would be great to have a universal exception that harmonizes that across borders so that companies, individuals, researchers would know that they had the right to analyze that material cross-border. Okay, so that's where we are on um, broadcast. Education and research. So as I mentioned on the outside, you know, this, this part of the agenda is, is nowhere near um, the kind of text-based negotiations that's going on with broadcast. So this is, um, the United States proposal, which is not a treaty proposal, it's a um, 
objectives and principles document. I actually think the objective, this is one of their objectives, but this objective is actually okay. Our objective should be to encourage limitations and exceptions in this area. But if you peruse the principles, they're really mushy. They provide really zero guidance to countries that might look at that document and say, okay, well, what should I do? It doesn't say countries should have certain kinds of exceptions at all. If you were to you know, cut and paste those principles and put it into your law, it would have no effect. So there are some groups that are asking the United States to revise its principles and objectives. And I think there might actually be some openness to do that. So that might be one place um, where some kind of US-based policy advocacy um, could occur and be helpful in this area. Um, but let me call attention to another document that's sitting outside, which is that there's a much more robust document that's been put out by Education International, which is the uh, Teachers Union Federation, which are over 30 million members around the union, and 40 other civil society organizations representing research and education institutions. And the key provision from that is a general research and education right, that we should move to require that every country essentially have burn Article 10.2 in their law as an actual exception, not just a permissive exception. That you should have a right to, to use works for education or research consistent with fair practice, full stop. So that, that if framed and harmonized, would provide that kind of flexibility that our research was pointing out lacks today. That too many education and research exceptions are not fit for digital purposes. And so having an exception that was broader would apply for that. And the second part of our, of our model um, in this area, um, then after that paragraph, and then kind of section two, spells out some specifics. So for people that want more particular guidance, we indicate some specific things you should have. So for instance, uses in the course of teaching activities such as and there's a super specific right, making private copies in the preparation of course instruction. But so the first is a broad general right, and then the second is a list of more specific rights for those who really like specific rights. And we realize there are people on both sides of that. And then I will just point out that that, that research exception re-enters um, this document as well. So my the first IP Watch article was just an op-ed, but so now this is, um, a document, and this is a slightly different form, but that has a much broader sign in by, by groups of, of education and research communities around the world. Okay, so, um, and this is just a flash of our webpage where you can find more information um, on that treaty. And so I think, you know, to conclude where I started out, you have, you know, two um, different processes going at, at very different speeds. Um, I think one of our interests in, in being present is that even while the, li the limitation and exception agenda is going much more slowly and we don't see the prospect of a treaty on the immediate horizon, the discussions within that agenda I think really are informing countries. And lots of those countries are thinking about or undergoing copyright reform now. So I think one of the interests of kind of being present in that discussion um, is to help move thinking on these issues, you know, even where um, the particular agenda is not rapidly going forward. But that said, I think there is going to be an uptick in this agenda over the next year, as I mentioned, um, with the various kind of regional meetings and, and, and conference that's going to be going on. So I think it's at least worth paying more attention to. So with that, I'd like to turn it over um, to Matt to kind of take us out with, you know, final reflections from a person who's been in this space for a long time and has particular interests in the debates. Sure. Cheers. Thanks, Sean. Uh, so my name is Matt Shears. I'm with the Computer and Communications Industry Association. Um, and in my roles representing uh, the tech sector interests, I uh, have participated in some of these conversations over the years, although I'll be frank, not as much in recent years uh, for reasons that I'll, I'll, I'll try and explain. Um, uh, Jamie did a great uh, job at the uh, outset, I think, teeing up what the, the politics were of the, the current conversations at, in the SCCR, the Standing Committee on Copyrights and Related Rights, uh, particularly with respect to broadcasts. Um, and, you know, to, to 
put it in a nutshell, following the internet treaties, everyone's rights had been sort of updated for the digital era, uh, except broadcasters, or at least that's the way broadcasters viewed the, the, the result of the WCT and the WPPT. Uh, everybody's got economics rights except us, um, and uh, they're still relying on the Rome Convention, which was, as Jamie pointed out, imperfectly implemented around the world. Um, uh, and, and, and particularly that's important because while it's true that all the content that is going over the broadcast signal is copyrighted, broadcasters are unhappy because in instances where there is signal piracy, uh, they are not the rights holder. So while there is someone who can sue, the, the broadcaster cannot sue. And so you have these scenarios around you know, cross-border retransmission uh, yes, there's a rights holder that can sue, but the broadcasters want to be the ones to file the suit. They want to be the ones to, to rattle the saber and, and, and get the money, and, and they can't. Uh, and rights holders, you know, from the perspective of broadcasters, aren't really uh, picking up the, the slack. Um, you know, is there a lot of this going on? There's, there's a, a handful of markets where this is a pretty common <coughs> phenomenon. Uh, there are a few cases uh, that, that are frequently cited. Uh, but it's pretty. It's, it's... Oh, your mics are fine. Okay. I was trying to turn on the. Ah, okay. <laughs> it's pretty area specific. Um, so they're in Geneva. Um, now the, the wrinkle here is, you know, as as, as Jamie had mentioned, uh, this this has been imperfectly implemented around the world. The U.S. handled this issue largely through our our telecom law, the retransmission consent uh, that we have in in uh, Title Forty Seven is is very different from how Rome works. Uh, so we have theoretical differences, and and that that creates a lot of friction. Which means it's not really until. I, Jamie, I'll correct me if I get the years wrong here, but maybe about 2005 or 2006 that the SCCR really starts to pick up steam talking about this issue. Um, uh, and, and so broadcasters are there, and some <coughs> technology sector interests start to show up. Uh, and I, I can see tech is a very broad term, but in, in, for purposes of my conversation here, there's really two constituencies there. Um, there are uh, webcasters, and, and this is back when we had a, a, a pretty diverse uh, industry of small webcasters in the United States, um, and other technology companies. The, the webcasters are, are, in, uh, are in Geneva because they have a, a particular perspective, which is that uh, there have been a number of instances in the United States where broadcasters got uh, a better deal than the webcasters think they got. So they, they perceive themselves as having gotten the short end of the stick relative to, to incumbent domestic over-the-air broadcasters in the United States. Uh, and and they're, they'll, uh, they're, they're determined that that not happened in the international context. So they're in Geneva saying, look, we, we don't really care what you guys do here, uh, but whatever the broadcasters get, we want to get too. Um, and so they're, they're agnostic, but they want technological neutrality. And, and that is a concept that the U.S. government sort of latches onto. And so there's a period from maybe about 2005 to 2009 where uh, the, the U.S. government and some other jurisdictions are, have sort of latched onto this term, and, and, and webcasting is, uh, is seriously on the table as a, sort of an expansion of the broadcast right. Uh, and now you have the other technology sector interests who are, are in Geneva, um, and they're not particularly concerned about the Rome Convention being updated, for example, but they are worried that these updates might result in laws in foreign jurisdictions to which they that would prevent them from being able to export stuff. You know, so it's 2006, 2007. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, product manufacturers who are looking at things that you know we, we take for granted now, the casting content within the home, just Bluetooth speakers, right? All these products haven't really been uh, uh, pushed out to the market yet, but you know they're they're anticipated, right? And the tech industry knows that this is coming, um, and and they want to be certain that it, at the very least there's something like that private use exception that, that Sean had up on the board so that moving content throughout the home uh, isn't impeded by uh, these new sui generis rights. 
Uh, so, and so these two forces are kind of pushing in, in different directions, and that causes great conflict uh, in the SCCR uh, and, and derails, I think, at least one potential diplomatic conference in, in that period, uh, which I, I winds up with the treaty more or less being put on the back burner uh, to, um, for other items to move first. And so we have Beijing, and, and then we have Marrakesh. And, and now, so all the other business has been dealt with, and, and then the, the WIPO Broadcast Treaty is still you know, on the back burner, and there's interest in, in revisiting this. Um, now that the issue has come back, there is a sense that these, these webcasting issues have been explicitly removed, and then there's only the question, to what extent does the traditional broadcasting right manifest in, in technological context? And I think for better or worse, the technology sector has come to this, the conclusion that uh, WIPO isn't going to screw this up. Uh, now, I, I think that may be really? putting uh, a lot of, well, <laughs> I, says, I, you know, yeah. I'm not necessarily saying that. You should send somebody to the meeting sometime. I mean, you, I, know, you might, might change your mind. I, I, I think that, I, that is my description of the consensus. You know, my own views are, um, you know, ha having seen the discussions occur in the past, I'm, I'm not quite as... Uh, confident about that, but I think there is a perception uh, that this just isn't uh, this isn't sufficiently baked that there is uh, exposure from the the tech perspective, right? Um, and and that, that also I think is a, an accurate description of how the industry views the limitations and exceptions issue, which in a theoretical level are very important. The 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 article. Um, InfoSoc Directive Article 5 and the sort of parallel concepts in the United States of, of fair use uh, ensure a lot of flexibility about temporary copies uh, with devices and in the home. Um, and I, I think in the abstract, the technology sector would like to see those, those exceptions harmonized around the world. Uh, but for the most part, there hasn't been sufficient litigation around these issues to create uh, the sense of real exposure. Um, and, and to the extent there has been, I don't think there's a lot of confidence that, that WIPO is going to move in a time that's relevant enough to solve these problems. And so by and large, you know, the, it's probably been eight years since the technology sector really uh, aggressively intervened in the SCCR to, to make their perspective known. Uh, now, maybe that, that shows, uh, I, I think as, as Jamie thinks, um, uh, short-sightedness um, but, you know, then the, the truth is, is if you go around the industry and talk to people about this, they'll say, well, wait a minute, how long has this treaty been discussed, right? It's, it's like, it's 20 years, and it's going to manifest now, and what is it particularly about now uh, that, that makes that the case? So, uh, you know, I think this issue hasn't been closely watched for some time, uh, and for better or worse, uh, because there's a sense that, that it's, as I said, just not baked. Um, but, you know, uh, it, at the end of the day, the, the industry views this issue primarily from a defensive perspective. Uh, they, they don't have an affirmative dog in the fight. Uh, they want to ensure that, pro that they can export the products and services that are being uh, developed here in the United States to foreign markets without running into IP complications. So uh, I think that's a, a safe um, characterization of where things are. I'll, uh, I'll conclude here, and maybe we can talk more about it in the Q&A. Can, can, I, can I just respond to that? Yeah, please. I was going to give you the first shot. And again, for the folks on, um, on Twitter, we have somebody watching the, the, PIGIP, the WCL underscore PIGIP account. If you want to ask questions, um, you can appear there. But Jamie, yeah, go ahead. Um, I mean, the idea that somehow uh, limitation and exceptions can kind of bail you out of the thing. I, I just like to, uh, to to say that that what what you're looking at is really creating uh, uh, an additional person you have to clear your rights from, an additional person that can sue you. You have automatic rights being developed uh, in Europe in the uh, enforcement um, uh, uh, agenda that's going on right now in Europe and probably followed to some degree in the United States. Um, you have the ability to really evergreen the protection of works by, by creating a right that extends beyond the term of the copyright. When the issue of whether or not 
the term of protection would stop when copyright was presented by Italy during the negotiations. It was completely rejected by the, by, by the other delegates uh, that, were, that were aligned with the, uh, with the um, right owners. So it is, it, is, it is a layer that you're not used to. It's a term that's longer. It covers things that are not even protected by copyright. And it's by entities uh, uh, which you have, uh, you know, which, which, uh, which you, you don't really know how they're going to act. That's one thing. The other thing, in terms of the negotiators, the negotiators change about every three or four years at, at, at WIPO. So um, uh, you have a bunch of people right now that have no clue about what the debate was in, in 2007, in 2008, in the previous years. It's all brand new to them. The reason it was stopped in, in 2007 is in the room, in the back of the room, was about 20 NGOs representing consumer rights organizations and free software <coughs> organizations and things like that. And then you had, uh, you had Intel showing up. You had AT&T showing up. You had a bunch of technology companies there were saying, we don't want this treaty. They were all showing up back then. So there was a big, uh, a big show by the technology companies to sort of shoot this down and separate themselves from the Yahoo position, which was pushing webcasting in this thing. And you had a huge, uh, huge NGO thing. None of that is the same today. You have basically, and you had the development agenda negotiations in the backdrop, which was a big limitations and exception agenda. That's completely changed right now. And so uh, the environment's way different. Uh, the technology industry is not sending anybody. They don't know what's going on. I don't know where they're getting information. Maybe they're talking to Shira and she's making them think that the U.S. Uh, and, uh, you know, proposal has some kind of big support within the, within the room, which, which is an opinion you do not get when you show up. Sean has been in the room. I think he can basically tell you whether or not you think there's widespread people jumping up for the U.S. proposal there. They're not. I mean, the fact the U.S. is a big country is the only thing they really have going for them right there. Now, uh, we also have a different ADG right now. We have we have someone that came from Venice. She's a, a very very much a hawk on copyright. Sylvia Ford. She she and, and Darren is the chair of the thing. All these all of these things are lining up in a completely different potential outcome. The landing position. If you get into a diplomatic conference, the U.S. will have one vote in a diplomatic conference, and they will vote on articles in a diplomatic conference. It's not going to be the consensus-based thing that you have that you think you've got going around right now. The odds of you having a really bad outcome in this on this negotiation are really high, in my opinion. With that, um, we're open to questions from anyone. So I welcome people to come in. But let me just follow that up a little bit, Jamie. So, so how, so how close do you think we are? What's, what's the kind of real politic? What, 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 are, what are some of the issues that are, that would need to resolve? Do you think for this to kind of actually go to a diplomatic conference? So we know, for instance, Gary wants the diplomatic conference vote like at the next SCCR. When do you think that might? Realistically, what would have to happen for that to take place? Do you think? Well, the big push is, is obviously to get a, a, um, a recommendation for a DIPCOM at the uh, at the General Assembly. The reason um, uh, I think it's possible to to block the thing completely. I think it's it's also possible that you'll be in a diplomatic conference either next year or the year after that. Um, uh, you have one phone call from Murdoch who talks to the President of the United States every week, apparently. And Fox in the past has, has sort of shown up in the negotiation to change the US position. Let's just, let me just throw that out there as like not a very minor uh, concern that we have right now. Um, now, um, uh, uh, the US is, well, they'll, they'll talk on Tuesday, but one, one possible outcome for the US is to say that they'll agree on a deal along the lines uh, of, of how the deal is sh shaping up, which was that the U.S. can interpret it one way and other countries can do another way. <coughs> so under that scenario, you can have uh, uh, long, robust uh, post-fixation to make it available rights coming from uh, people that want that in Europe and South America and other countries. You can have the U.S. sort of maintain the status quo here. You can have a uh, reciprocal rights thing that sort of uh, is an upward upward ratchet on the thing. And you're going to have the EU just 
basically put this in every single free trade agreement that they do, like they tried to do with it for a while with the database treaty before that thing blew up. And you saw, you know, that put in the Mexico agreement and things like that. So I think the odds of you going into a diplomatic conference um, uh, along the lines of uh, uh, the U.S. doing damage control with the theory that it's not a big deal because the U.S. isn't going to sign the treaty being, being fairly high. The other thing I think you need to look at is that not to be discussed here, but the Hague Convention is, in a, in a very non-transparent process, led by the Europeans again, is proposing a, uh, uh, a copyright-specific and patent, like IP enforcement treaty through the Hague Convention, the thing that they failed to get uh, a decade ago. And that's actually, right now, um, uh, moving along in the Hague right now. It's not part of the UN system. Uh, uh, we were not able to get credentialed uh, to attend the negotiation because they said we didn't have expertise in intellectual property rights uh, 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 cross border, you know, which was I thought pretty weak. Um, you know, uh, uh, they, but they, but but they had a group that did, and that was uh, the recording industry. So they were basically they 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 had the you know the insight they needed from basically the right owners. That was basically the only NGO uh, input they needed, and that that creates a a, uh, 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 a cross-border enforcement mechanism, which is also pretty dangerous, which, which, which amplifies the danger of any kind of sui generis right that you create like this. I have a question. Bonjour. So I'm really curious. And I think um, these mics should work to help pick up okay. on the, on the webcast, even if you don't hear it yet. Yeah, I have a question for Jamie. I'm yes. very curious about um, the developing country position on broadcast treaty because this is really, really bad for developing countries because people in developing countries, they don't watch video on demand. They watch TV. Now, and it, it is now, free. You that, know, like that we are talking about millions of people. Like that's the only way for people, those people to connect to the world. And what is the position of like developing countries? They don't say anything. They don't object, like because they will create small like copyright monopolies in their countries, like, and this will have implications for their people. Well, I, <clears throat> I, I, the developing country position is really sucks on on this particular, for, for not not for every country, but for several different countries, um, and one of the reasons for that is because historically broadcasters were nationally national entities and so uh, you wouldn't have AT&T owning a broadcasting station in a foreign country in the past I say in the past because things are changing but in the old days uh, the Brazilian broadcasters were Brazilian the Kenyan broadcasters were Brazilian in a lot of developing countries they were government actually government owned broadcasters uh, uh, and uh, so these were, these were people that had uh, political influence in the countries. They were considered local people. And, uh, and, and they were fairly close to the, to, you know, to, the, to, the, to the government officials in those areas. Um, but also, they, they have political power in it. That means Earth. Is it, am I, is it better if it's here? It's OK. Say something. They have political. They have. They have. They have considerable political power. Just leave it like that. Uh, um, uh, what's going on right now is that is that even though free over the air broadcasting is something you see, you see, you see cable television in developing countries. You see satellite television. You see encryption sort of thing happening. And you see things being delivered over the internet and over smartphones and things like that. So right now in, in um, uh, India, Spotify is trying to get a compulsory license because they've purchased uh, a broadcasting entity. So there's litigation right now whether they're entitled to compulsory license as a broadcaster in India. Uh, uh, the, the penetration of Amazon and Netflix and some of the other bigger streaming entities right now on sporting events, uh, as well as entertainment and on video on demand. It's not like it's not like a non-entity right now. It depends on the country to country. Yeah. But I don't really think 
that if you if you go ten years from the future right now, you're going to be talking about the same kind of uh, 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 broadcasting environment you saw ten years in the past. I think things are changing fairly fast uh, in developing countries. Uh, we certainly you certainly see that with the massive penetration of smartphones, for example, in a lot of countries, um, and. Uh, um, and and and, with, and and the and 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 wireless delivery is becoming pretty efficient in a lot of places. So I I think that this is uh, uh, for historic reasons the broadcasters were perceived as their local guys. In the future, it's not going to be the local guys. It's going to be big technology platforms out of Europe and the United States primarily. They're going to serve almost every market. Can I, may I add on to that? So I think there's a pretty simple calculus that has long driven those developing countries that have been have supported an aggressive uh, sui generis right for broadcasts. And that is, it, they look at the different buckets of rights that are out there. Uh, and there's the core copyright rights, the creative industry. Uh, and developing countries for the most part, are net importers of those works. Then there is the related rights and phonograms. Uh, they are net importers of those rights too. The one bucket of rights that you might conceivably implement where you have a strong domestic industry would be broadcasting. But who's, who's going to pay for it? You know, it's the, the thing is, like, it's not that people are connected in those countries. Like, we still have, like, problem of connecting to people to the Internet. And then, I mean, of course, there are people in India who can afford video on demand or Netflix or Amazon. But, the, like, the most of the country, they don't even have connection or, like, in Africa. So, I mean, who will pay? Let's say that they, they came up with this broadcast treaty and... In, in country X in Africa, I'm not giving using an example, they have a broadcaster, but people will pay for that, like, you know, but I don't, I, I, that's what I don't understand. So, so, I just, I mean, I think what, what I, that, it may be the case that, that there would be, you know, problems with the domestic population mm -hmm. licensing the, the broadcast, but, but the calculus is that on net we're going to have other markets paying in to, to because we now have rights where we have the industry. I'm not. I'm not saying that is the right calculus, but it, my, my experience when when I was uh, in Geneva a lot was that the, 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 the broadcast treaty was viewed as a means for uh, balancing out the scale, uh, and it was it was it was our industries, our domestic industries in in these LDCs versus the other industries in from cultural exporters. And, and I think there's also a political economy question. M many broadcasters in developing countries are state-owned. So it's, this is not just about our broadcasters in our country perhaps acquiring rights. It's perceived as the state finding a mechanism to somehow, you know, by the magic of have intellectual property rights, forget about step two, make money, somehow recover some of the costs of broadcasting. So certainly in South Africa, South Africa has sometimes sort of opposed the broadcasting treaty and then sometimes been in favor. And that depends on the influence basically of the state agency that's a big broadcasting agency, which perceives this as a means. So there's a political economy question. Who within the state perceives that they will benefit? Now, whether they'll actually benefit, of course, is open to massive debate and doubt in every imaginable way. But the, 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 I think the perception is, in, at least some of the time, in, in some developing countries, that the state can, through this right, somehow make its broadcasting operation pay for itself. I can, I can, I can give you one example of where a lot of confusion is. Uh, if, if, you, if you have a channel uh, like the Discovery Channel or something like that, and it's being, through satellite or through cable, it's being broadcast into another country. People thought that the right would, would go to the person that, uh, uh, that set up the encryption in the home or, or, or provide, ran the cable wires or something like that. But that's not actually how it's going to work. It's the, person that, it's, it's the entity that schedules the content. So it's going to be Vivendi or Disney, which will be the right owner in those cases. It will not be the local cable television operator. 
that's just not well understood among the people. And it's not understood deliberately. I mean, there's just a lot of uh, attempt to j just have stupid conversations like this is about piracy, for example. That's, <coughs> that's one of the, just to give you an idea of the politics, groups as, as diverse as EFF to the recording industry have all supported the idea that there be a version of the treaty that addresses privacy issues and uh, 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 piracy, piracy issues. That's not really a problem. It's, it's really the post-fixation rights is where really, and the making available rights where things kind of break down. If you go back to 1997, uh, uh, 2007, um, uh, and, and until like about, f about two years ago, CSAC, the recording industry, um, uh, the actors union, EFF, our organization, we're all on the same side. It was really an unusual coalition. It was all of us against the broadcasters. Probably the most vocal group in the, org in, in the negotiation in the past was CSAC and the recording industry, which were beating up on the broadcasters and very vocal from the floor. That's completely changed. The broadcasters have now completely, and when I say the broadcasters, I'm not really talking about uh, the, the, the people that, uh, you know, that, that, that run the radio and television stories. I'm talking right now, the people that are perceived themselves as the right owners are basically the big M MPA members. It's like Vivendi, it's like uh, Disney, it's like um, uh, Viacom, it's, it's, it's entities like that, like our Time Warner. They perceive themselves as the primary right owners right now. And um, uh, so, uh, uh, you know, they, that, that's a, um, and, and they've been able to co-op uh, uh, the copyright industry trade association, so they're not really vocal anymore. And that's really changed. And can, maybe we could unpack um, a little bit more kind of the U.S. proposal, right? So my understanding of the of the U.S. position is that they don't want to require post-fixation rights, but what's but if, they'll but they'll but they'll allow it as an option. I mean yeah, that's where that, that, that? That, I mean that that's where it's headed. Well, the U.S. would like to prohibit it. That just is a non-starter because if you were to give the broadcasters like all the enforcement rights you can possibly imagine, but no post-fixation rights, there would be no diplomatic conference because they don't want that. They don't think they really need that. They don't really want that. The, the, the anti-piracy stuff, that's for the suckers. I mean, that's basically what you say to make it look like a really compelling story, like who wants to be on the side of the pirates. When they're given the opportunity, and they could have had this 10 years ago, and they could have it tomorrow easily. If it was just an anti-piracy agreement, they could get that. But they don't want that. They definitely want post-fixation rights, and they want very durable post they don't want They don't want, like, like two weeks of post fixation rights or, or, or a month of it or something like that. You know, they want like, like it's a question of how many decades of post fixation rights they want. And they definitely also want, I mean, the making available right, I'm not sure, you know, that that's really the big issue at this point. But the post fixation right is a huge thing. And the limitations and exception thing is all about the post fixation rights. Look, at, if we're going to have 50 years of post fixation rights, we're going to want to have really good limitations and exceptions, things that the copyright owners would absolutely <coughs> hate. If there's no post-fixation rights, we don't really care about the limitations and exceptions framework, you know. You know, I mean, we're not going to argue about that part. So it really gets down to, if you have post-fixation rights, the broadcaster right becomes a super right. It's more important than the copyright because it has stronger rights than copyright, less of a, it has less of a window for exceptions, and it lasts longer than copyright. Jim, did I hear you say before that the U.S. might uh, in some way support the treaty being agreed to but not sign it? Well, yeah, most people think that's the, you know, what will happen is the U.S. will go through the negotiations, uh, do as much damage control as possible. And, and the U.S. has done a good job, in my opinion, with what they've got. They're isolated. But then, you know, the feeling is that it wouldn't be like, like we didn't ratify the Rome Agreement. We probably wouldn't ratify this treaty. Uh, I, I'm not saying we never would, who knows. With, we have a president right now I never thought we'd get. We have a Congress that acts in ways that kind of surprise me on the Senate side. So I'm not gonna say that they would never sign and they would never ratify. But the sort of conventional wisdom was the US would kind of go with the negotiation but not sign. But who knows what you know, the future might hold. And 
the post-Trump apple world. So I've just kind world, of thrown you know, the limitations and exceptions, you know, provisions back back up on the screen now that we've kind of unpacked a lot of this. So I think there's there's a, a direction. I think there's this question from the U.S. policy position of they've spent time focusing on the kind of rights aspect, and they have this provision which basically says you may, but you do not have to have post-fixation rights, right? So as soon as you say you may have post-fixation rights, then it brings in the real questions of, of where the limitations and exceptions are, and are any of them mandatory? And so reflecting back on that kind of research, a lot of the, the exceptions that exist for things like education and libraries and archives are work-specific, and very few of them mention broadcasts because broadcasts aren't protected by copyright, right? So if you can only have what you have in your copyright already and what you have in your copyright is work specific, then you could very much end up in a world in which broadcasts have a new right with an actual term on it. And there's no automatic right to use that, for instance, in an education setting or in an archive or a library where these things really are included in public repositories. If, if the U.S. ratified, would fair use be a same kind of limitation or exception? <clears throat> yes. So the, the U.S. could apply. So I don't know if the, so I guess this is a question for the lawyers. I don't know that the U.S. would have to change its current law in order to sign the treaty, even if it wanted to, right? We protect most... We already have signal protection. We protect most of what's transmitted over broadcast by copyright. Uh, yeah, I guess. And, it went, and you wouldn't have to have a term. So you could, he, they could end up having, they could end up what we have already, which is just signal protection. Right? I, yeah, perhaps. I, there's I, this weird, <laughs> there, there's this weird wrinkle to the entire broadcast treaty structure. Uh, because the broadcast is is not a fixation. It's this ephemeral thing which is transitory. Um, and yet we're attaching a 50-year term to a transitory thing without an instantiation. Like what does that what does that mean? Like it has protection in, in deep space where it's you know once it's, it's gone 50 years out into the universe. Uh, so there, 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 there almost has to be some kind of fixation for this long term to be meaningful, but the protection doesn't appear to apply to a fixation. So it's, it's weird when you start to try and transpose this concept into the U.S. system of limitations and exceptions, which presupposes an instantiated work. I think, I think it, it, the, the U.S. would, it, it really depends on, on if the U.S. signs it and what the final version of the thing the U.S. delegation will try and make it so they have to do, as most countries do, they'll try and make it so they have to do as few things as possible to U.S. law. It's hard to say how successful they can, they can be at the end of the day because the, the, um, uh, it's, uh, the, the status of, of works that are now in the public domain is something that's a, a, a pretty hot topic in the treaty. I mean, the, the broadcasters are saying that that things that are not copyrighted in other countries, uh, uh, or or even in the U.S., I mean, they want uh, you know uh, c certain kinds of live events. They, they 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 it may it may be impossible for the U.S. to completely avoid any changes, but certainly the objective of the U.S. is just basically to be left untouched by the treaty within its own borders. That assumes so that you really think broadcasting is a terrestrial, you know, geographic thing within the United States. And because this really has to do with transmissions over the Internet, all this discussion about, you know, what constitutes a, um, uh, uh, the broadcasters make it clear they will not allow the, the right to stop with, with you know, like a, like a live broadcast. It, it has to include for them uh, some kind of, uh, uh, sending the signal out over the internet, and once the signals go out over the internet, I mean it's uh, um, uh, you, you're, you're creating an environment that even our, our our tech companies like Netflix will have to deal with whatever the environment is that's created in this. Yahoo, uh, social networks, Facebook, things like that. I mean, Facebook people put up clips all the time of video shit on on, on Facebook and stuff like that. 
right mm -hmm. now your, your primary concern is, is it protected by copyright? Is it protected by copyright in the US law? It's now gonna be, is it protected by copyright and a broadcasting right? Identifying the broadcast right holder is really difficult because you can, you can sort of figure out who the copyright owner is. You see a film, for example, or a newscast, it's like, oh, that's Dan Rather, or that's, uh, you know, that's John Oliver, or, you know, this is a, a movie with, uh, you know, Jennifer Lawrence or something like that. You can kind of figure out, but who the heck knows what, 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 broad, what broadcaster they got it from, if it include everything from Netflix to Hulu to, uh, you know, one of 25 cable channels in like, you know, 150 countries that could have presented that uh, information initially. So you, you really won't know um, how, how, what your liability is on, on, on those things as well. I mean, um, you know, I, I, you might think at some point there's enough watermarking and sort of digital signatures and stuff like that. All those problems will be sorted out. You know, I, I don't think you're really there on the metadata side that you can do that. But you're, you're creating a, a clearance of rights, which is re really problematic. And also, in terms of all these cross-border enforcement mechanisms that are coming into play, I, I don't think people are paying enough attention to, 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 to what's coming down the road in, in that end. The, the idea that you get to, like, just ignore foreign copyright rules or, or foreign uh, sui generis rules, I think is naive. Uh, it's naive for certainly naive for people that are building platforms that want to you know want to go outside the United States, but it even becomes problematic here if you want to actually show something here that was acquired from a foreign uh, foreign source that would have been considered infringing from the source, even though it's being where are the documentary here. producers? Pardon? Yeah, where are the documentary producers? Well, I would, I would have to say they're just not even in the room. I mean, that's, that's the problem we have is that the, the content owners used to be great. Uh, 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 the copyright and content people used to be great in these negotiations. They're just not showing up. One of the problems is expensive to go to Geneva. People have cut back the things. C CCI hasn't been there for years. Um, uh, uh, you know, they have this sort of theory about what's going on, but it's, it's, it's wrong. But, you know, they won't test it by showing up. Uh, Al Alan goes there from time to time, and, and he, he, he's sort of seen what's going on. Not on broadcast. If you haven't been there for a while, I know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's a, but you, you, you've also sort of seen the change in the room, right? I mean, the, the, you know, the turnover of the delegates and things like that. It's, it's, it, it just, it's just there's a new crop of people that are there. And uh, also another thing that's changed is the positions are more coordinated than they used to be. Back in the day... I remember, you know, used used to like hear different <laughs> European countries express different views on uh, in the on copyright issues. Now it's like you know the European Union really coordinates, and and because of that, the African group is more coordinated. Grulac is more coordinated. Uh, you know, the the different regional groups are, are you know, they, they discipline their own members quite a bit. So once one, once they adopt a position on something, it's harder it's harder to sort of get. Uh, a debate on certain things. Um, almost all the negotiations are being done off the record in these informals. Uh, if you show up, you can actually listen in on them. Uh, so uh, all of the broadcasters are all listening in everything. Uh, if you're not in the room, you can't do that. We're not allowed to use social media, so we can't report or tweet about what's going on. Even under Chatham House rules, we can't report what's being said, even if we withhold who said it. So you have an asymmetry of, of, of insight into what's going on. Uh, uh, just just because of the way they hold the negotiation, they don't really talk about almost anything on camera with a video stream in the public sessions anymore. So, yeah. So we receive yeah. a few questions on Twitter. Okay. Yeah. Why don't you give us all of them? Okay. There are two main ones. Um, a rule, George Scaria from the National Law University of India asked. Do you see any major changes in the position of developing countries like India on broadcasting treaty-related negotiations? And then the other questions from Timothy Vollmer from Creative Commons. He asked, can you talk more about the WIPIL regional seminars on limitations and exceptions? What's the goal and how it fits into the overall SCCR work plan? Great. Jamie, you want to discuss the changes of, of Indian broadcasts, and I'm happy to talk about the regions. Well, it, the, the Indian position a while uh, changed a couple years ago. Uh, I don't know if it was a year or two ago, uh, with uh, uh, this 
discussions between the Z, initially in this discussions between the Z network and um, and 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 Mari, who is the you know who, who's the very you know strong leader in 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 the government in India. It hasn't changed a hundred percent, but India has really used to be a very vocal and very important player on the broadcast treaty, and they were. They were surprisingly good, given the fact that they'd signed the Rome Convention and, they, and their domestic law wasn't really favorable from our point of view in terms of the negotiation, but they were very strong on a limited, thin right and very closely aligned to the U.S. in the old days. But they're not in a, they're not in a, in a strong a position. The diplomats are in a strong position because of the, uh, the, the, uh, the political pressure they have to uh, work with the Indian broadcasters. And, and actually, the, the North American broadcasters... <laughs> Uh, and the uh, and the, uh, the the Hollywood people work very closely with uh, industry in India to to use them to lobby the Indian government, and they and they do that everywhere. They you know, so basically the broadcasters were pretty bad uh, lobbyists initially uh, on this thing. If I was to go back into the, into like the previous decade, but they've really upped their game, and they do it pretty much with a local strategy. I mean, they try and show up with people from local uh, local broadcasters. They show up with people from uh, from Brasilia, uh, from, you know, from O Globo. They show up with, uh, with, uh, with uh, they try and get the uh, Indian broadcasters on the, on the panels to talk about things and stuff like that. So I would say that the Indian position is, is uh, changed in a way that uh, we're, we're unhappy with. Um, sure. Um, so answering um, Timothy Vollmer's question, I think that the regional um, the regional seminars are designed to get more feedback from people uh, on the ground in those regions. So as Sean mentioned, there's three. There's one in Singapore, and that's supposed to cover stakeholders from the Asia-Pacific region. There's one um, June 12th to 13th in Kenya, and that's supposed to cover stakeholders in the Africa region. And then the third one is um, going to be held in the Dominican Republic uh, July 4th and 5th, and that's for the Latin America region. And um, these regional seminars are designed to meet with uh, SCCR members and the stakeholders to analyze the situation of libraries, archives, and museums, persons with disabilities, educational and research institutions to see where uh, copyright is hindering the activities of providing access to um, people in those countries by these cultural heritage institutions for educational research purposes for people with disabilities, how copyright can um, might hinder that, how limitations and exceptions in those countries operate, whether the uh, stakeholders in those countries, even though limitations and exceptions might exist, Sometimes they are insufficient, um, particularly in the digital world, or they are confusing and um, the uh, stakeholders in those countries don't really use them, that there might be legal uncertainties, that some of the, the laws might be ambiguous or might be a little bit vague, um, and to also see where cross-border issues would be uh, a solution to some of these problems or help alleviate some of the issues that stakeholders in those regions face. And then the conference on limitations and exceptions that is going to be held right before the next SCCR, it's an international conference in Geneva, um, that will explore some of these issues, but I think we'll also be really looking at different international instruments and the strengths and weaknesses um, and the opportunities and challenges that these different types of instruments would have, so hard law versus soft law, um, what other approaches might be taken, how contracts and licensing play a part in, um, in, in uh, you know, addressing these issues or how, how uh, contracts and licensing could prevent some of these limitations and exceptions from um, being utilized by the beneficiaries of these exceptions. So I think, and <clears throat> I've been working... Um, on the limitations and exceptions with some of the education and research groups. Um, and so I th there's, there's been a, a little bit more maybe uh, intelligence, if I can say, on, on some of the construction of the, of the agendas, which is mostly that there's not a whole lot of firm agendas in this area that, that we can figure out. So the um, sketch of the 
workshops or the seminars in each country appears to have like maybe the first half day or so would be essentially presentations by some of the researchers who have put together um, reports. So there's a library report by Kenneth Cruz and there's a um, education report by Daniel Sang. And then there'll be um, space for uh, workshops and discussions, which appear at least at the moment to be fairly open-ended. We haven't seen any um, particular guidance and that might change in the next SCCR round. But I think some of the comments that have come out of the education and research community have been um, requesting that the seminars have um, a focus and that the focus be on the relationship between copyright and um, access to learning and educational materials, that that be the focus. There's been some fear that's been um, more or less documented by previous seminars like this that have been held um, on the publishing community writ large, as opposed to kind of the role of copyright within education and libraries, et cetera. Um, and so I think that if they lack a focus on the particular copyright issues, not a lot may be one, um, but if they can have um, a stronger focus related to the agenda of SCCR and discussing the possible role of international instruments in this area, then it might be a place where the ball kind of moves forward. And so I think that's one of the issues that will come up in the next round is around um, trying to see how those workshops will actually be developed. The hope is that they might have three components. I mean, that one might be a mapping. So the both the library and the education reports do map exceptions in various areas, but they're thousands of pages long and they're not very, it's not very easy to get through them. There's been discussions of creating some kind of a typology or some regional data, et cetera. So the regional meetings could be useful on that. So a mapping um, experiences. I mean, so hopefully they would be a place where local regional um, beneficiaries could share experiences about any barriers in their activities from a lack of exceptions. And then some kind of outcome, some kind of uh, adoption of principles or something to move, move the text forward. I mean, that's kind of, I think that's kind of a, a wish within the research and education communities. I think libraries are putting together something similar, perhaps. Um, but so that's, that's still a space. It's possible that that space will be so open that uh, local and regional participation in the meetings could be very important. So if it does, if the meetings don't have any structure, then the outcomes of meetings will depend on who shows up. And mm -hmm. so showing up may become very important, especially if the meetings are highly unstructured. Um, other um, questions and comments from here? Any of our... I can, I can uh, on the yeah. limitation exception. Uh, there's a lot of differences in limitations and exceptions uh, regionally. So the Northern European, they have a big emphasis on uh, uh, sort of ex extended licensing approaches. They have this civil law approach in the EU, and this, and then you have the the, the, you know, the U.S. <coughs> fair use, which is trying to promote around the world. It's very difficult to get an agreement among countries to change their domestic law. There's just so much. Uh, their institutions are built around the existing law. So there's a lot of resistance in the French trying to, you know, go along with the Americans or the Americans trying to go along with the French or Northern Europeans or whatever. So that makes it really challenging to imagine the kind of norm setting for copyright exceptions that you had, for example, in the Marrakesh Treaty, where the Marrakesh Treaty, you really had um, a, a, a higher degree of similarity among exceptions. Particularly if you look at something like education, where the exceptions landscape quite a bit different, I think, from different parts of the world. I think that the, that the uh, archiving preservation is something that looks like it could happen in terms of a norm setting thing, because the exceptions are, are, are fairly robust. I mean, I mean, fairly similar from country to country. Some, uh, there, there's still a lot of countries that don't have anything just because they've the way the way that developing country technical assistant worked is they're told they have to do the rights. Nobody tells them to do the exceptions. So the exceptions sort of uh, are kind of lagging in developing countries. The best exceptions are usually are in the higher income countries. But the one area that's that's sort of less money's involved 
and there's a bigger public interest in doing this, probably the archiving and preservations, in my opinion. You could do something like that. To do something like education is really challenging, unless you do it at a high level. And that's kind of where the negotiations have gone. Is there, and that's what the U.S. has pushed in terms of the principles, and that's what, that's what the, uh, I think that the work that, that Sean has been doing with Jonathan Band and other people in education now has sort of kind of wrapped, wrapped it, uh, kind of, kind of put it up a level. So it's not the same kind of micromanaging of the exceptions just on the, Mar the Marrakesh uh, Treaty negotiations, for example. A different approach, which we favored, and we've had no buy-in so far, is that, is that they, they consider uh, a revision of the uh, Tunis model law or the appendix to the burn for developing countries. Those are two developing country only instruments. Most of the demand on exceptions, uh, no, I should say most of them, there is a significant demand on access to knowledge that comes from developing countries, an area where all the studies have shown they have an inadequate landscape of exceptions. And those are, those are initiatives, that, that, those are totally out of date instruments. The Tunis model law, which was pretty good in 1976, is like, a, you know, it, it's, it's old. And then the, uh, the, the, uh, the appendix to the burn was just crap. It just didn't really work. And those, those are kind of the same vintage back in the 70s. And so because they've updated all these other things, like, you know, the, the, they want to update the Rome Convention, they've done the Beijing Treaty, they've done the White Post Treaty, you can make an argument for doing like a developing country. One thing that advantage that has, it doesn't force the French and the American and the, and, 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 and the, and the, uh, the Dutch people to agree on what the, what the framework is. Because even though you have a certain amount of, uh, of, of uh, uh, you know, I mean, it, there's a lower degree of compliance in developing countries, so changes in the legal structure are not as traumatic for countries there because not everyone's even paying much attention to the law, for example, on education exception in a lot of developing countries. I mean, I've been in libraries in countries that are just full of copies of books that have been photocopied, and I don't think you could do that in the United States. You can't do it under the law, but they do it anyhow. And I think that the advantage of doing a developing country instrument is you'd get people to get into a more lawful system. Right now, they have like they have like no exceptions, but they just ignore everything and they just infringe. And if you want people to move toward lawful behavior, you have to give them a law that makes sense for the environment that they're in and for the you know the uses they need to put it to. So I I, I push for that, but I think that that, that uh, the, the, Ameri the, the librarians are really opposed to this because uh, most of the lobby lo lo lobbying from the librarians comes, comes from European and American, you know, I mean, North, I mean, I mean, I mean Canadian or, or European groups, and, and they really want something to, to address uh, their issues in those countries as well. So I'm just giving you kind of a dissenting view of our organization, which is we'd like to see, um, uh, think through some other options for the SSCR, uh, limitations and exceptions, uh, than, than, than just just like looking at what Marrakesh did and then trying to apply it to education, for example. We, we, we just think that's not the right moment to do that. So let me <clears throat> just thank everyone for being part of this today. As I mentioned at the onset, so this is new for us to um, do a seminar kind of before an SCCR round. Um, I'd love to hear any feedback over lunch, et cetera, about whether this was helpful, whether we should do more or different. Um, the next SCCR round, as I mentioned, will be in October, and there's supposed to be a large um, conference on limitations and exceptions before it. Uh, so we might try to do another one of these um, briefing sessions before, uh, before that meeting. Um, thank you to Jamie and to Krista and Matt uh, for joining us up here. And for all of you, we have a lot of experts in the room. As you may have noticed, we are on break right now, so there's no students here. Um, so this is you know, entirely a group of people who are in the know. Um, and so we'll be providing lunch outside so we can all chat with each other um, off the cameras. And uh, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Cheers. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the uh, battery. That's very really cool. What is it? Is it a battery? Yeah, yeah it's, it's one of those little things. So when your phone goes out, I like this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just my battery's crap on my phone.
But I, uh, I actually just I ordered a new battery for oh, my phone because everybody else in my world. It's, yeah, uh, diff different orientation. <laughs> and my son, who's yes, twelve, yeah. just added sure. that app. Yeah. So like, well, yeah. I guess I did. Like, check the settings in your check like, your notifications. Okay. Your I guess I'm. Yeah. I guess I'm getting no. advi good advice from my son. No. <laughs> That's true. Sure enough, so I had to talk to you. Can we leave our here? Yeah, you can leave stuff here. There's, there's nobody here. Nobody's coming in. <laughs> Last time I spoke to them about the mouth well, they like, I don't know what I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I they're just a big one. Yeah, I know. I know. I mean, I've been using it too much. Right now, we're distributing. Yeah, I know. Yeah, like, not the world can't support it. Yeah, I know. 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 I know